Mohammed Bad. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thanks very much indeed for that. Uh, uh, good evening, assalamu alaikum, mm -hmm. and uh, any other greetings that uh, I'm not aware of. Uh, and thanks very much, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, as the introduction said, um, in terms of, uh, I hope I'm here, to just explain some background to you about myself, as to if someone like myself, who had no education in any, any form or kind, when I came to Britain in 1966, that if I can do it, so can you. And there's many challenges you'll face, without doubt. Uh, to suggest there isn't racism, it's not true. To suggest there isn't Islamophobia, it's not true. All these things are there. And I, let me say this to you, that, uh, and I'll explain to you in stages. I went to, uh, I was part of an investigation into riots that took place in Bradford back in 1996. And there was a professor of, from Bradford University. And uh, he came and uh, we challenged him and we said, uh, <coughs> Muslim kids, when they go for jobs and they're saying there is Islamophobia, and uh, because of that, they can't get a job, they can't access good education. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, I, I don't buy that notion, and I don't agree with that statement. And we said, why not? And he says, uh, because the Muslim community uh, can produce more imams, more people, who can actually recite the Quran part, which is a holy book, massive. No other religion or community can do that. And in the Muslim community, if they put their mind to something, they can do it. If their children could do that, proportionally, percentage-wise, there's more of them who, who can read. Then he says, you can do that because you can overcome it. A Sikh person who wears a turban is more visible than a Muslim person. He says, if I look at you, you were walking the street, or you go for a job application, and tell, we read your name as Mohammed Taj, we wouldn't know that you were a Muslim if you were just walking the street. So he says, you know, when you go around, talk to your young people, he says, tell them, providing you put your mind to it, you can do it, you can achieve it and whatever the hurdles are. And I'll uh, take you through some of the, you know, my background and how I came through and I got involved in the trade union movement. And I've made some notes just to uh, make sure that I can actually remember in stages, there's a tendency people tend to forget. And I went to a Labour Party meeting in Manchester, and if you remember, Ed Miliband forgot about migration and the economy, and he was heavily criticized. So I didn't want to <laughs> criticize Ed did the session today. So let me tell you that my uh, background uh, is that I my originally are from Mirpur in Azad Kashmir. I was born there and bred there and I of course used to live in the Nil village and uh, when the dam was built we had to move up, up, out into the new city. And we still live in a kind of a, uh, village called Sangot uh, in the heart of Mirpur itself. When I was uh, 14 and a half I came to England and the reason we came here is because my father came to England in 1960 because he had TB and he was a truck driver working for a British consortium building the dam. And when they did medical checks on him, they discovered that he had TB at a very late stage. He had only six months to live. And he's one of his bosses was Scottish. He lent him 50 pounds. Those days, 50 pounds, you can believe you me, was a lot of money. The fare to England were probably something like 90 pounds or so. He had no friends, no relatives. And when he landed at Heathrow Airport, he was diagnosed with the TB. So they put him in an ambulance because such a late stage and they took him to uh, Grassington, uh, and it's a nil village near Cattlewell, and it's an isolation unit because in those days, the, even the British medicine didn't know how TB spread, and so they were really quite keen to isolate. Six months, and there was not a single other Asian person there, and uh, he felt very much lonely. It took him six months to recover, and then uh, he said, where do you want to go? He said, well, just drop me off somewhere. There's lots of Asian or Pakistani people. And it was Victoria Street in Bravery in Long Lane, the famous place he would have dropped off. And they asked someone, and somebody says, well, come in and we'll help and assist you to find people who come with your part of the Mirpur, and you'll be able to help and assist. They couldn't find anyone, but there was a guy from Singapore, and he said, look, you can stay with me. And eventually he found a job, and he managed to stay. And that's why he came here, uh, to overcome his illness. And if he hadn't come, he would have been dead in six months. And he called us over in 1966, when I came with my mom and my sisters and brothers. And all of my brothers and sisters, including my mom, they also had TB as well. I was the only one who didn't have it. So they, it was a very early stage, so they were cured. So I'm always grateful to the NHS for saving my father's life. 
I'm grateful to the NHS for saving my mothers and brothers and sisters, and that's why we're still alive today, although my mom and dad's passed away. My dad used to, you know, inspire us, and he used to say to us, he says, you know, I want you to go to school, I want you to study, and I want you to help and assist others, because I couldn't read and write, and other people used to write letters for me, Phil Forbes, and I have this aspiration, I want you as brothers and sisters to be able to help and assist others. And believe you me, I used to hate that, because, you know, I just wanted to get on with my life, and those days, you know, when you're 15, 16, you're absolutely mad. And you think you know everything around you, but you actually don't. And uh, so I went here, came here, went to school for three months. And I was 15 years of age. In those days, you had to leave school at 15. So then I went to college for a year and a half. It was a two-year course. But it was basic English I had to learn, because I couldn't speak a word of English when I landed in Britain. So I went to Bradford College. And it was an co English course for overseas students, two year. But I couldn't complete the whole two years. So there was a diploma at the end of it. Because my father was the only breadwinner, earning six pounds a week, and there wasn't enough money to go around. So I saw his hardship, so I left school. And I went into factories and mills. And then, uh, a later period, I went into uh, retail. It was a big store called, uh, you know, like Rackham's. It used to be called Brown Moss in Bradford. And I worked there for two years. And I was training to be a manager. And after about a year and nine months, I didn't really like it. I wasn't getting on with my dad because we always had these fights, arguments. So I left home, you know, like you did in the 70s. I went to London, lived in Liverpool, St. Helens, and Manchester. Eventually, I came back to Bradford because my father was ill, a grandfather, and I was very close to him. And he says, come on. So I came home and I stayed there. And then I sort of uh, went to back to Premier in Kashmir. And while I was there, when my grandfather died, I was to get buried him. Then, of course, you know, I saw my wife, Nassim, and uh, really liked her, and she liked me. And uh, she was already engaged, and I wasn't engaged, but, you know, I wasn't coming back until I could persuade her mother and father. And my mom and dad wouldn't agree, neither would her parents. But I managed to use my trade union negotiating skills, <laughs> which I acquired later. And, uh, of course, I can tell you that after 41 years of marriage, <coughs> I'm very happy. And, uh, you know, the relationship we have with each other is tremendous. And, uh, you know, in trade union work, any work, you need a partner, whether it's a man or a wife, who's going to support you, what you're doing. And I think it's important, particularly men, support women when they're trying to develop their careers, they're trying to educate themselves. Because that is something I've discovered from experience, because I have three sisters who didn't have the education either, by the way. And they got to where they wanted to, because uh, they were determined through Shia work. One of them is the police force, the other one is a teacher, the other one is uh, into fashion design, and none of them did the GCs or that was A-levels because those back in the 70s, you won, women particularly weren't allowed to go to school and college because you know they're going to be married off, have children. And although I was kind of unique in my family that I was challenged that aspect. And, uh, and I remember when my wife came to England and she wanted to go to learn English, evening classes, and my younger brother used to live with me. Uh, he, would, he didn't speak to her for two years because uh, she was going in evening classes. And I said, It'll do you good. Go and learn and uh, you will actually have your independence. You can go out shopping and do everything you want to do rather than being a company. So I think it's, that's crucial. That's a big challenge in our community. We still have. And while I was president for the last 12, uh, 12 months, I in fact went all over. And uh, one of my aims was try to motivate our Muslim communities in particular from Kashmir, Pakistan, other parts of the world, to say that we should give a fair and equal chance to men and women, young boys and old people, to have the education is so crucial. And in Britain and in Europe, uh, if you have an educated woman in the household, you're more likely to have educated children, other people, because they tend to spend the time and the effort. Men folk, I know from my own experience, I spend literally my life like attending courses or getting participating away on Saturday, Sunday. So now if I told you that in the 12 months uh, while I was doing the president's job, I was only home five weekends. The rest of the uh, Monday to Friday and Saturday, Sundays, in fact, I was never home. And if it wasn't for my wife's support and the help and assistance, I would have not been able to do that job. So I'm always grateful uh, for my relationship. And I think, you know, all of us, particularly men for, you know, we need to uh, keep this in mind that we need to support our partners, whoever they are, whether they are daughters, they are wives, they are sisters, we need to do that. 
So that's uh, where, in fact, I originate from, from Kashmir. And I've actually covered very briefly the, you know, the, my employment and uh, my education. In 1974, when I came back from pa uh, Pakistan, Kashmir, uh, I went to work in a foundry for six weeks. And after six weeks training, I went on my own on Monday and I had to do the job on my own. I burned the gloves and my hands and I dropped everything on the floor. And the foreman was really abusive. He started swearing, cursing. And I says, don't you swear and curse at me. He says, on my way out. Picked my coat and left. And of course, I went and I got a job on buses as a bus conductor. I didn't have a single friend, I call you. I worked there for a period of two years. I became a driver. And then, of course, uh, I got involved in the union. I joined the union day one, which was Transport and General Workers Union. Didn't know a thing about it. But there was my conductor when I became a driver, a guy called Richard Jowett. And he said to me, he says, Tanz, he said, what do you think about your countrymen having to pay bribes to get jobs here? And but those days, you know, if the uniform fitted you, you got the job because uniform used to be short in supply and they couldn't get the right size for you. So if the uniform fitted you, the job used to be, you could get a job on buses because they used to employ 1,600 people. But the reason the buses were a good job was because people who, in fact, came from India and from Pakistan, <coughs> graduates, highly educated. And, you know, nowadays, some billionaires like that, guy who owns the best way cash and carry. Uh, he, in fact, used to work as a bus conductor in Bradford. The Agra chain restaurants, they used, both brothers used to work as bus conductors and drivers. And, you know, I can name you lots of the people who, in fact, made through, because the records are kept there. Uh, Sometimes I go through this book and have a look. And what it was, those days, the best highly educated Asian person the job could get in the 60s, 70s, was in the buses. People actually liked their job, won the early potential over time, but the most crucially, you know, there used to be a lovely uniform. And, you know, in India and Pakistan, anybody has a uniform considered to be, you know, a really smart, powerful position. And it was one of those, you know, you have coat of arms. The, and if you remember, some of the people had their pictures taken with a hat on, with a watch, everything. They used to be, take pride. Uh, because that was the best job going, because otherwise factories and mills was really hard work. So when I drew, and I saw that, and Richard said to me, he says, uh, what are you going to do about this? My answer was, I said, well, what can I do? They said, look, you know, let's go to the union meeting. And I went with him. And when I went and I came away, and we were working together the next day, he says, what do you think about the union meeting? I said, oh, it was great. He says, did you enjoy it? I said, yeah, I did. He said, we're going next month again. And I said, oh, God, I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> I didn't understand a thing they said, what they talked about. I honestly were bored to death. I wanted to get out there as fast as I can, go and join my, with my mates and do what are we going to do. Nevertheless, you know, I said I'll come to the next meeting next month. And I didn't go on, he went. And the next day he was really furious, he was bad. He said, you promised that you were going to come, and I was going to for you, because it's your countrymen who are actually suffering there to pay bribes. If you're from Kashmir, Pakistan, from India, and you, people tend to used to leave the job, go over, come back. And what, if you kept leaving and coming back, leaving and coming back, what they used to do was they didn't used to offer a job again. So there was Asian people there. And union people involved, management were involved, and they took bribes up to people. And those days, believe it or not, bribe used to be 200 pounds. Now, if I told you that uh, 200 pounds was equivalent to nearly two months' wages nowadays, uh, so those days, now it's hard work. Why should a worker <coughs> who's going to go out there, work, earn the money, have to pay a bribe to someone else? So my involvement actually was because of injustice taking place. So I got involved. The Yorkshire Post were carrying out investigation. They spent 14 months at it. I helped and assisted with them to getting the evidence together. The story was exposed in 1977. Came the newspapers. Cut a long story short, case, uh, case went to court. The personal manager was white. He had a heart attack in the high court, and he died there. And the other people, in fact, who were involved, they said it was them who took the money because he was dead. <laughs> the job I do as a union branch secretary negotiator. The guy who was there was white. He was a union-wide official. I do his job now. And he was doing it before me for 10 years. He was involved, so he went to prison for 18 months. There was a guy from South Asia, uh, originally from India. He went to prison for nine months. And the real two crooks who actually was behind him took all the money. They got away scotch-free because they had good barristers. And, citizens. and that was my starting point. When the story was exposed, broke out, then the management knew, the union knew, that it was this, you know, kid 
and they used to call me a kid who was, I was 21 years of age, a lunatic, I think I was referred to. It was him, he had been behind it. So basically they started victimizing me. People would talk to me and uh, they tried to get me sacked. You know, they tried to frame me. And when they were attempting to do that, other workers, young guys, older guys who were white and Asian, some Asian people actually were really upset what I did because they thought, well, at least I could come back from Pakistan, get a job, but this idiot has stopped me doing it. However, the progressive people, young people, I said, they felt what I did was right. So they said, you know, we want you to become a shop steward. And you know, my first instance was, oh no, I can't do a shop steward's job. I'm not capable, my English isn't that good. I will not be able to do it. So they pushed me. I was nominated as a proposing secretary. And I got elected, I got IS4. And there used to be 75 people standing the election, and they were, had to elect 22. And I got the highest uh, votes. And I thought, you know, these people who voted for me, they must have done it for a reason. They must have. So that's my starting point in the trade union movement. Then I went in 1980 uh, to Bradford College, where I recruited 80 Asian and black people to attend a trade union course at Bradford College. And we were trying to get them involved. And they did get involved. Uh, I ended up teaching as well, which I really didn't want to do. Oh, I was offered a job at the end of the 12 month period at Bradford College. I declined because I really wanted to go back. It was a 12 month project funded by the Commission of Racial Quality, the TUC Bradford College, three way project, 30%, 33%, And those 80 people, in fact, went on to become shop stewards, council, lords, mayors of Yorkshire. Uh, tremendous. And I always have that pride that I managed to achieve something. So I came back on buses. I drove buses for a year. And then I, w I was elected uh, as a vice president. Then after two years, I stood for elections, and I was elected as the current position, which is a formal convener that you actually negotiate terms and conditions, which is represent people in disciplines, which I did uh, for a, a long period of time. And then, of course, in the 80s, mid-80s, we had a lot of racism. And uh, I would certainly be happy to ask questions, and I won't go into depth in that, uh, but I'll be happy to answer questions. Let me tell you, it wasn't easy. There were massive battles with the National Front, Ian Powell, for example, the famous speech of Rivers of Blood. And my own trade union doctors, they actually walked behind Ian Powell, supporting his policies about migration and uh, victimizing people. You know, in the 70s, if, uh, and there used to be Skinhead's movement, you'll have probably read about it, and they used to go on Bradford on Saturday Sundays, they used to go, uh, you know, drinking, and they used to say, we're going on a, and you would refer to as Paki bashing. So anybody who's Asian, doesn't matter whether they're Pakistani, everybody was told to them was a Paki, if they were actually Muslim. There's lots of people actually suffered massive injuries, and there was, a, and we were involved, part of those campaigns, fight against that against uh, restaurants, pubs, and others who refused to serve black people. And uh, let's not forget, Bristol is not too far from us here. It actually had a, bo uh, there was a boycott there because they wouldn't employ black and Asian people there. This is early 70s, and you wouldn't imagine that was happening. So there was a boycott of buses, white, Asian, black people in Bristol. And if similar things were happening, they wouldn't employ people. But in Bradford, when they employed Asian people, they wouldn't promote them. So when I got elected as branch secretary, the first challenge we had, we challenged it, we brought CRE, we carried investigation. We had 150 inspectors, 700 Asian black people working there, not a single manager inspector. And when we brought the CRE, they carried the investigation. It took 18 months. In 18 May, months, <coughs> surprise, surprise, they managed to promote nine black and Asian people as inspectors because by the time the inquiry the report came out, they were able to demonstrate they were making you know, and you know, if you came today, 90% of our inspectors and managers are Asian. And the workforce is literally less than 45%. Because there is talent. There were people who could do the job. But they were not given that chance. And then there was also a problem where people from India, Africa, whatever they were, they used to go back home. You know, some of you remember, to visit their mom and dad's parents every two years, three years. So when you left and you came back, you were engaged. So you always lost out your pension interest your government of refunded. So we had to actually put, address that, so we fought a battle with the company. So we introduced a system, negotiated an agreement with them that you could bank two weeks of your holidays every year, and the 50 or 60 year you'll have 12 weeks, and you took that year's holidays, you could go up to Pakistan, India, or Hajj, or whatever, for 18 weeks. 
That agreement we still have in place. White workforce opposed to it, but we managed to persuade Ford campaign. There was a battle held. We won. That agreement is still there, and it's so beneficial. Nobody ever has to leave their job because they can go up to eight weeks, six months, five months, whereas by banking those weeks of holidays. And so I think you know where we understood. I understood. My colleagues understood the needs of people from the subcontinent, where the white officers didn't or didn't want to. And I, that's the role I've played over the last 30 years in the, my own union, trying to teach and get the message across to people. So look, you've got to have understanding. Let's not forget, you know, this discrimination takes place. You are a union member, some of you mm -hmm. maybe. You might have a good experience, you might have a bad experience. You got an officer, you talk to them. I always said, only a woman understands the issues of women. Only a black person can understand the issues of, uh, uh, of, of, of black people because of the culture, the background. And I think this is why it's important that our young people get involved in trade unions, <coughs> in social affairs, <coughs> in society, as councillors and MPs, because we will have a better understanding. And you know, democracy needs honest, sincere people. And I know honest and sincere people that are lacking. And we need those. And I always am a firm believer that, you know, if we get 10 through, maybe two of them will make it through. I can tell you that, you know, in my own union branch, we had 256 people join the Labour Party. We produced 11 councillors. So I was always proud that we managed to do that. So what was my feeling? My feeling was, my colleague's feeling was, we failed to hold them to account. Because when they got there, they felt they were there on their own. They didn't really care. They were in there for the money, for the prestige. And the invitation that rather than saying, I'm here to serve the community. And I think it's important people remember and we need to dis decide that which, when the election takes place. And I say to people, you know, you should decide to support a candidate or not to support. Based on, ask yourself one single question. Does that person deserve your support? Does that person have the same values, same beliefs? See, I joined the Labour Party many, many years ago for one reason and one reason alone. The Labour Party is not what I joined. It's not something that I really want. I'm all Labour. I joined because of Clause 4 because there was massive inequality of wealth, and that was we supposed to do that. Tony Blair came in, apart from the war, he upset me by taking the clause four away. But and if you look at today now, 20 years ago, 10% of the population of Britain, they own 90% of the wealth. Current statistics <coughs> are, 1% of the population owns 90% of the wealth. Now, equality has gone, unless trade unions, politicians, others, we can readdress. We are not going to be able to get out of this austerity situation. Like say you, you and me will go out to spend the money. The rich and the wealthy, they'll actually go put it in the bank account, the savings account. And for the economy to grow, improve, get better. And the trade union movement, the workers have done well over the years when there was growth, when the growth takes place. Last five years, what we in fact have seen is a decrease in living standards to the tune of 2,800 pounds per worker. Working. But what about those people unemployed, don't have a job? And, you know, in the next two, three years, it's going to be very interesting what happens in Britain. And depending what happens, the one outcome for working class people, in fact, who are at the very bottom edge in terms of our ability is earn 40, 50,000 pounds. And I don't call anything, anyone rich unless they have millions in bank accounts. You can have a house worth a million pounds. But what use is it? is it? Because you're paying the rates for a rent for a... Uh, in, you might get something out of it when you sell it. But you can't do anything with it until you sell it. So therefore, there is a real problem. And if I look actually at the Kashmiri community, and I'll be very happy to answer the, some of the questions, statistics that are available or are hidden or kept away. Establishment in Bradford or the part of the country, in fact, they don't want people to be recognized the basis. I can tell you that one experience we had in Bradford uh, was that Bangladesh community was performing very badly. Statistics were pursued, uh, 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 they were produced because there were four people who launched the campaign, then they got another 20 people. And rightly so, by the way, as well. Because at the end of the day, there was a massive problem of education for young people. When it was identified, Bradford Council uh, uh, diverted 180 extra pounds per child. Uh, it was on a per three month basis but it puts you know, a big lump, pot of money, big sum. And if you look at 15 years ago, what the education and attainment levels were of Bangladesh kids, compared to what they are now, they have improved 
by 90%. So if you actually target resources, you identify a problem, then in fact you can resolve it. And I talk about the experience that uh, when 95 riots took place in Bradford, uh, I was put on the uh, Bradford Commission. And there was three people on it, Professor Sheila Allen from Bradford University, a guy called John Barrett, he was a former chief executive of Cambridge <coughs> Town Council, and he was also uh, a lawyer by profession. Three of us, we came, sat on that commission for 14 months. We interviewed about 900 people. We knew exactly what the problems are, what the difficulties are. And so therefore, I said to them, I said, look, we've got to produce a report. So we produced a report, and we were going to make recommendations. And my two colleagues wouldn't agree to the recommendations. And I said, no, we set out. We are aim and objective, what we were told we had to do and produce. But the politicians, in fact, decided to change their mind. They said, we don't want the recommendations. And uh, the reason they didn't want the recommendations was we highlighted the problems that were there, what they had to do. They really they didn't really want to know. Because it's going to cost money. They're going to have to divert resources from rich, wealthy areas of Bradford into inner cities, and they didn't want to do it, if there's a report. So I fell out with them. I couldn't agree. So I refused to sign the report. And uh, then I was accused that because I was a Muslim, I was trying to protect the Muslim community. And so therefore, I had political ambitions. So they would, I was brief against. They refused to circulate my uh, minority report. If you ever have a chance, if you Google search, or if you ask for I'll send you it. It was called A Can Do City. <coughs> and uh, I dedicated it to my father, because the day my report was released, my father died. And uh, I produced my report four days later. And basically, there's a new poem I wrote. It's something he said to me. And because uh, it was when he was in his final hours, the day before he died, and my uncle came from Dewsbury and he says, You know, Peter, have you asked your dad where he wants to be buried? I said, Yes, uncle, I've asked him. He said, What did he say? I said, He says he wants to be buried at home. He said, Well, have you got your visa sorted out? And, you know, because you need to apply out urgently. So my father started uh, blushing and laughing, you see, and he says, Uncle G, why are you blushing? He says, no, I'm not actually blushing in your university, but I'm just really observing the question he asked my son, the answer he gave, and the response he gave. And he says, why? He says, you know, you want to be buried at home is back in Kashmir. And he says, no. He says, home is where your grandchildren is. Home is your, where your family is. Home is a city that's giving you a job. It's home is a, a country that's giving you a life. So he says, this is my home, and I want to be buried. And back in 1996, you know, it was taboo. People didn't want to be buried there. After him, everybody literally gets buried. And recently, I saw two people being brought back from Mirpur, back to England. And you know, I thought, this day had to come, didn't it? Because the children said, no, we want our dad to be buried here in Bradford, because this is our home. So I think it's important that we treat you know, our cities, where we live, as our cities, our home. And we need to work towards prosperity for our families, for those cities. And I think this idea, thought, well, you know, uh, Kashmir has got a problem. Yes, it has, and I want to help with this. But, you know, we got our own problems of Kashmir, Pakistan, here in England. Unless our young people succeed, men and women, we have more disposable income. If we do, we can actually make a better contribution back home, uh, wherever we come from, to assist those communities. But if I'm an unemployed benefit of £58 a week, my disposal income is going to be likely to be limited. I can't help. So education is very important. Let me share this with you. Back in the 70s, you know, we used to sit down, talk, and I've got lots of Hindu and Sikh friends and others, because I used to work at buses and these old communities. And I used to observe our older generations who talk about, this is our home, we're going to go back, we're going to buy a plot of land, build the house, the rest of it. And I used to seek with Sikhs and Hindus, and they used to say, we've got to invest in our money on the children's education. The women, men used to go to work, uh, 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 and you know, young girls. And the Pakistani and Midbi community in particular, they used to be really critical of Sikhs and Hindus. They are, there's a word called Big Arabs, you know. They send their women to work, and you know, they won't allow that to go. But you know the thing, I think we should take leave out of their book. The women went to work, they earned the money. What did they do? They invested on the children's community, <coughs> women and, and uh, and boys and other things. They have prospered in business and education, and that, that, that's why they're receiving the dividend now. And I think if we did the same thing, at that time I wish, you know, our communities, those areas, we invested money in our children, but we didn't. And you know, those days, 
that uh, what used to happen was, uh, once I remember my father saying, we need to put our house right, and I says, I says, I said, I said, I said did you really have to do? He says, what do you think? I said, I think it's a waste of money. I think we should buy a house so my brother and sister can have a bedroom to them, I can have one, others. And he says, uh, no, he said, we've got to because otherwise it's a shame for all our families. And you know, he sent 7,000 pounds to build a house. 20 years later, he's got another letter saying the house is falling down, the bridge came. And you know what he said? He says, he said to my mother at the time, he says, you know, that I just said to yours, he's an idiot. He doesn't realize, you know, and the consequences of not. 20 years later, he said to my mom, he says, you know that idiot son of yours? I think he was right 20 years ago. We should have invested the money here, bought a house. And I think, you know, this is story. Now if you look at, the Asian communities actually are spending the money in Bradford. Bradford is growing, the economy is growing. Shops are benefiting from it as well. But <clears throat> Bradford, tragedy is that we had textile employers taking money out of the city. And we had our own community taking the money out of the city. As a result of that, Bradford actually has done so badly, manufacturers disappeared. The call center job that we still have, they're going to disappear in the next 10 years once the voice recognition technology gets better, which it is improving day by day. So I think, you know, we've got to have innovation places like Oldham, Manchester, you know, Bradford, Dewsbury, because these northern cities where large chunks of our communities are living, unless something happens, we're not going to be able to create the jobs which are necessary in growing communities. So that's the, you know, my sort of involvement when I came in. Now, you know when I said to you that uh, I was, uh, I went to the Bradford Commission, I spent 40 months, did a report. Just prior to that, uh, challenges we're talking about, in 91, a colleague of mine from Huddersfield, he says, there's a position of a worker director uh, coming up because we bought our company out for 22 million uh, by a worker by management buyout. The Conservative government at the time, Margaret Thatcher, she forced bus company to be sold off uh, to private companies. Well, we decided to buy our company out in Yorkshire. There were 5,200 employees there, managers, drivers, others. And we bought it for 22 million. And that allowed 49% ownership to the workforce, 51 to the executive directors. So we could have two worker directors on the board of the company. And so we had an English guy that was elected, elected on there. And then a guy called Jimmy from Madishwil, he said, you know, I've got this aspiration that we want to see somebody for our community on the board of the company. And I said, what, there's just 300 of us? And there's 5,200 indigenous white employees. Who the hell do you think in Leeds, Madishwil, how are you going to vote for us? He said, you know, you can do it. You're a good campaigner. Anyway, he nominated me, proposed me, and when I started running, and you would have thought, my own union? I st was going to step aside, going to support me one day. They opposed me. The other four unions, they opposed me, because they'd done a deal. There was another guy who was the right wing, they were going to support him. So I ran a campaign, I asked the company at the time off, and they refused. They said no. So I used to finish work, I was a full-time union official, from nine o'clock until five. I would finish five o'clock at night, go home, and get about two hours sleep and get up and start visiting bus depots. There was something like 80 bus depots. 5,200 people meet, only five weeks. So I campaigned. And so I was going to go to a place called Todmonden <coughs> on the outskirts of Halifax. And I said to a friend of mine, I says, uh, tonight I'm going to go to Todmonden. He said, don't go there, mate. He says, they are just racist. They hate black people, they are Asian people. And particularly Pakistanis, he said, don't like them. And he says, the old white people, and there's just 52 of them. Why waste your journey time? So I was determined. I said, no, I'm going to go there. So I got there at 2 o'clock in the morning. There's these engineers sat down having tea and coffee. So I announced myself. I said, look, my name is Mohamed Taj. I'm here to talk to you. Can I actually take five minutes of time? I said, yeah, go ahead, speak. So I spoke. They asked me lots of questions, answered them. There's one question I couldn't answer. They said, we've heard they're going to shut this depot down. I said, well, I've not heard, but I will go out and find out, come back for you. And so I went, came back, and it was not true anyway. So I told them at two o'clock in the morning, I went away, election took place, ballots by depot, and I won by 39 votes. And there was 39 people actually cast their vote in Todmonden. Because the ballot box was separate area by area, so I knew when they opened the box, I got all the 39 votes. So I said, well, everybody told me that was a racist area. Why how come I've got 39 votes in a racist depot amongst white people, not a single Asian person. So I was intrigued, so I went back uh, four weeks later to, and I asked them the question. 
And one of the guys says to me, engineer, he says, you know, there's a guy called Jimmy, Irish guy, he's night after night, he's, in a, he's, a, he's a mechanic and electrician. He says, he's the most senior bloke, and we said to him, he said, Jimmy, you know, this election coming of these ballot papers, who shall we vote for, he says. Uh, so he said, and this is exactly the words, he said, he couldn't remember your name, and he said, I can't remember his name, but you know that Pakila from Bradford? He seems a good egg to me. I'm going to vote for him. And because of that, everybody else. So I think moral story is, don't take no for an answer. Be determined in whatever you want to do. Challenge things. And over the years, you know, my sisters, I got told, you're rubbish, you're going to get nowhere. My sisters as well, but they were determined. I was determined. And eventually, after all those years, uh, I got elected as president of the TUC last year. And I was the first you know, Kashmiri, first Muslim, first Asian, because nobody ever has been elected for the last 144 years. So in for a worker, a person coming to this country, uh, who is still a worker, end of the day, uh, achieving that is a huge amount. And I think it is a great respect and honor for me to s do it on behalf of our communities. And while I was there for 12 months, you know, I got the highest number of invitations up and down the country abroad in here. I actually travel abroad more often in 12 months than I did in the whole of my life because there's a huge demand to come and speak, particularly in <coughs> Europe and European countries. And I've been the you know, spokesperson on behalf of the TUC on international migration. And, uh, you know, recently I was knocking on the doors of the European election and the, uh, the one knocked on the door, an old bloke, and he says, you know, he said, I'm sick and tired of these immigrants coming to this country, the rest of it. And so, I, you know, what my answer was to him, I said, look, I said, you know, I'm a son of a migrant worker. He made a tremendous contribution to this country, he paid his taxes, he hardly drew anything up. So don't expect me to stand here and condemn the uh, migrant workers, migrant people. They suffer the most, they take the worst housing. Because I remember, some of your parents, family remember, people used to share a bed 12 hours each at a time. And you know, they used to take care of each other. If somebody's unemployed, others used to pay the money until you got a job. There's tremendous sacrifices. And we're no different, the Irish community, the Jewish community, because they had to suffer the same. Now we're going to see the you know, people coming from Bulgaria, the parts of it. If you go to Bulgaria, go outside at the, the, you know, the poverty levels. You know, if somebody rich and wealthy millionaire can come invest money here, and we welcome with open arms, my view opinion is, workers should be welcomed with, by us, by open arms. We should help them support. As a trade unionist, tell you what I do. I'm working towards stopping the exploitation that's taken by the rich and wealthy. Because I know my parents and our forefathers were exploited by the taxi industry. And as a trade unionist, our job actually is to ensure that we fight injustice against those individuals. Because when we were here, we didn't know the law. Other things <coughs> my father didn't know. Employers took advantage. But now, you know, in my workplace anywhere, you go and check out. No drive will take no nonsense from a manager because they know their rights. They'll stand up. And that's as a trade unionist, that's what I aim to do over the years. And what my message to you today is this, that, you know, we got to inspire people. We got the long holiday agreements. And, you know, there was a small demand by about three Muslims who wanted to pray in our bus depot. Company refused because they said our policy is not to provide religious facilities. So we came on a Sunday, brought plumbers in, engineers in. We turned one of the room like this, a corner by, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot into a prayer room, put a door, plastered it, put windows in it. And the same day, we paid, you know, a huge amount of arm and a leg on a Sunday. But we determined because when management came back on Monday, it had a notice there, we said, pray room on it. Management went, hey, why had they wanted to sack me, sack my chairperson? So I said, sack me if you want to, but they didn't. So we give the key to the small senior person who wanted it. He said, here's the key, you're in charge, and you're the amount for this local <coughs> room here. And ever since then, they've got prayer room facilities in Bradford, in Leeds, Huddersfield, Halifax. You know, sometimes you've got to <laughs> take a stance, be courageous. And I always say, that, you know, if something is uh, morally wrong, then I always say politically it cannot be correct. Morally it was right. There was a batch of workers, they needed the facility. They're employed by employer, and employer should provide the facilities. And then, you know, we had the Hindus and Sikhs came and said, we want a facility as well. You know what we did? We got a meal as well for them. We said, you know, it's not just for Muslims. We're here to represent every person. And I think it's important that when you're in a representative role, that you've got to do it very honestly and sincerely. So, 
In 99, I got elected on the executive, General Executive Council of the United Union, and uh, I was the first Asian person to be elected out of 62 people. And you know, the election was held amongst 1.2 million people. 1.2 million ballot people sent out. And I wasn't the only candidate. I had another three people standing against me. And it was the first time I was standing, and these other people were standing for the first time as well, because it was a new position they created for black and Latin minority people. So I said, I'm gonna contest it. So I won it, and I'm still there after all these years. In about two years time, when I'm 65, obviously I'm looking towards retirement. But I've been preparing someone else to come and replace me. So we got a young uh, Pakistani guy and uh, works for a, a sweet company in Halifax. He's only 26. And uh, you know, some people say, you're a Pakistani? He said, no, I'm Dutch. Because he is a mom and dad up in Lahore. He was born and bred in Holland and Rotterdam. So he, of course, he speaks Dutch. And he learned his English when he came to England at the age of 14. And he, in fact, is an hour exactly, and he's the youngest person. Very articulate, uh, uh, and I'm very happy that when I go, he'll be there to t stay on the board, uh, the executive council. And so when I was the first person, now we got eight Asian and black people on, on the executive. Because I've been trying to get others on, help and assist, show them the ropes. In that period, we've actually got women as officers of the union. <coughs> Let's not forget, you know, some of you in the union, as officers, they get paid 60, 70,000 pounds in an excellent pension scheme. So there are tremendous career prospects as administration officers and trade unions, they are actually role model employees to pay well. And I would say to you that if you are a trade union member already, get involved. If you're not, if you're employed somewhere, join one. But you know, don't give your union dues for nothing. Make sure you ask for something in return. Take your rights. Because if you're paying insurance premium for something and your house got burned down, you're able to make a claim. That's what trade unions are there for. And if they're not actually handling a job right, they're not treating you right. Go to someone or work. contact someone, you know, get, because there's lots of us in all unions. We are trying to help and assist. And I get calls every day, every week, other parts of the country where people have problems with their offices, with their managers. So I can't actually go and represent them there. But what I do is I put them in touch with a local person. So I've negotiated, I've represented people in my workplace with disciplines. And in terms of when it comes to industrial tribunals, I go and represent them. And this is someone who could not speak a word of English, went to school for three months and one and a half years. Now imagine all you young ones here, that you've had the, you know, the whole opportunity to go to school or college. There's so much you can do. And you know, if I told you, and you wouldn't believe me, that I didn't have confidence public speaking until last year in September 2013. I went to a public meeting, 7,000 people in Liverpool, I was asked to make a speech about the TUC in three minutes, and I really screwed it up, made a mess of it. And you know, everybody shook and he says, Taj, that was a wonderful speech. My colleague was with me there from Bradford Court, Taj Salam, he's my grandchild, and he says, tell him the truth, tell him it was rubbish. It was, it was horrible. And I said, tell him it was horrible, it was a, and because, I'm glad, because I said to them, he's right, you know, I know it was rubbish. And so I said, I'm not gonna do it no more. And Taslam says to me, he says, you're no choice. You're going to have to do it because there's others. And so therefore, I didn't go to any training, but I was just determined to make sure that I do not make a fool of myself next time I go somewhere because I'm a representative on behalf of our communities. Because they would say, well, you know this Asian guy, or Pakistani Indian guy, he was rubbish. I said, I don't want to say anybody say that. So that's when I get it. But I say to you this, get yourself the confidence early it's not difficult whatsoever. All it really is is just forget these people said before you. Look at the last person in the room. And you know, I've been looking at those two young ladies in the back all the time. <laughs> but all of you think I've been looking at you, and I haven't. <laughs> you will have this confidence. And I want you to have that because our community can do so much. Our young people can do so much to make me proud and others proud. And the parents proud, most important. Because you, you know, my mom and dad, your mom and dad and others, all they want to hear is nice things about you. Your daughter is wonderful, your son is. If somebody says, you know, says, well, you know, I saw your son drug dealing in the street corners, or he was in the pub or the club, whatever, your father or mother, they would be really upset. I know mine wouldn't be. So I think more of the story later is, I hope what I said to you 
it will inspire you that if I, a bus conductor or a driver can do what he's done all these years, so can we. Thank you.